a live edition of Halftime Chat. And we've got um, our special, special guest, Mr. Chucky Booker. You know, it, it is always a pleasure and honor that he, he takes his time out of his massive schedule to actually chat with us. And uh, Chucky, you're welcome. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing just fine. I'm doing great, Namdi. Everything is good. Steve, what's up, buddy? Good evening, sir. <laughs> you know, I'm just running and gunning, man. I'm I'm doing I'm balancing between three and four projects at the moment. So I'm just running around with like a chicken with my head cut off. You got a fresh haircut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looking very fresh. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. He's been drinking from the fountain of youth, and, you know. I, saw, I saw your picture that it was featured in the unsung "You" by the keyboards and a hat, and I'm saying it looks exactly how you look now. No, 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 no. <laughs> how would we in that picture? Actually, I have aged considerably. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, how would we in that picture? Oh man, it, which one? I'm trying to remember which picture it was. It was one that you were sort of in the living room of your house. White shirts and by keyboards. Oh, it was using yeah, a song was, video. Oh man, that that was like, I think that was like 1987. That was wow. 1987. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, we got people joining in, but starting off that, how you know how was the reception from your own song? How did you feel watching it on on TV? And, and wow, stuff? you know, it was really weird. You know, watching that 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 unsung. Uh, episode for me. I don't know why it was just really weird, man. I I think it's because I've never had something that in depth from a, you know, from such a, I guess, from a TV perspective, you know, of my career and my life. So it was really weird to watch that. I'm so used to watching all my friends, you know, and their episodes, you know, and then it's like, all of a sudden, it's like me and I'm like, whoa, you know, it's weird, you know, but it was cool. It's been, it's been, uh, a great reception, you know, people said, hey, you know, they've, you know, text me and said, hey, man, it was really informative. You know, there was things that, you know, I didn't know, you know, things of that nature. So it was cool. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I guess, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the stuff that, you know, is it, you filmed it about a year ago? Yeah, it was a year ago. How long ago. did you film it? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, it, it must have been quite a wait, though, but um, did did they tell you when it was going to come out? No, you know what? They didn't let me know until like maybe two weeks prior to the release. So I had wow. no idea. You know, it was supposed to, I think it was supposed to come out earlier. But, you know, they had some issues, you know, with, I guess, with production and timing and things of that nature. So it, you know, it, it took a little while longer. But that was definitely over a year ago, you know, that we, we made that. Yeah, well, a good, uh, I guess the good timing is that you've got your show at Yoshi's on the 10th of yeah. April. Yeah. yeah. So um, do you want to tell us about what's going on, University 2.0, Chucky well, Booker, DOL? DOA. You know, uh, me and my, my, my bestie, uh, DOA, we're just trying to put this uh, show together for all the fans, you know, of, of, you know, funk music and, you know, just timeless music, man. We're going to add a few things extra to this show that we we didn't do in the last one so it's going to be kind of cool i don't want to give it away but it's it's going to be a, it's going to be a lot of fun man i guess i can. <laughs> i guess Maybe. yeah no, you know what I'm, yeah. I'm not i'm not going to give it away <laughs> no 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 you don't have to and, and you guys you, you can you, yeah this is live southern california and uh and and Collins, so you can ask questions in a yes. bit i guess one of the things is because I was putting the clips together of some of your videos, I'm like, actually, Chucky can sing, and I think we, you know, because you, 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 you after your two albums, you did the music director stuff and the whole River Nation tour. Yeah. I was like, yeah, he was a singer and he could perform. Yeah, I, mean, I, and, I and, could perform, but I, I don't really consider myself a singer. But what you had the highs, your falsettos, you were doing everything. That's, what do you mean? That's you all smoke and mirrors, man. You know. It's, I, I don't really consider myself a singer, you know, uh, more or less. I, I would rather uh, consider myself a musician first, and, and, you know, and then everything else follows. A musician, producer, you know. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, I, yeah, I, no, definitely, because, I, I, you know, you, you, you could see the musicianship in, in everything that you do, but I guess it's the... It is um, vocally you were distinctive, and that's one of the things that we did we did miss. 
um, about that. Um, but but coming back to Yoshi's, I mean, is this stuff that you guys are going to be doing sporadically, or do you think you may you may do some more oh, no, dates? Oh we're, de we're no, definitely doing some more dates. Uh, this is just a uh, this is just the start of possible, you know, seven to eight cities that we're looking at, not looking at, we're in talks right now, of making uh, shows happen in Dallas, uh, Chicago, Atlanta, New York, uh, Nashville, and I don't know what else, I think it was either uh, Miami, no, no, not Miami, uh, oh, in, in uh, North Carolina, just okay. to start. How, how do you feel about being the headliner instead of oh, being... Great. I love it. I love it. You know, it's, it's a safe space for me. You know, I've, I've always been one of the guys that have always been behind the scenes in, in the background, yeah. which is cool. You know, I, I, that's like so easy for me. But I think it's cool after so many years. It's like, OK, you know what? Let me jump back out front again just to, you know, just for a change of pace. You know, it's, it's like, you know, I've, I've been doing the, the musical direction thing forever and I'm still doing it, you know. So it's great to like change up and, you know, get back to the creative juices again of doing a, a live show. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. How was it the Earth, Wind and Fire Land oh, Richie man. tour? How did that, that go? Was amazing. That was absolutely amazing. Uh, I mean, just from wow. the, from the standpoint of, you have Earth, Wind and Fire that's actually opening up, and they are kicking. They, oh, they, they, they were ass? opening. Wow, that's pressure on you guys. What, man? <laughs> you know, I tried to tell Lionel, but hey, man, let's let's you know do a little bit more of this and that. And he's like, no, you know, he he has a, a a certain way, a specific way of how he wants his show. So all I could do is just suggest things, you know. But man, it's 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 difficult because they came out blazing like every night. I was watching that show every night, like, man, I wish Lionel would just let me, you know, take the show and just run with it and let me do my thing. But, you know, he is who he is, you know. So, you know, it's, it's tough. Okay. You know, it's really, it's really tough, man. Because they, they are. So it wasn't a game. Because I've heard um, Morris Day talk about when the time used to open up for yep. Prince. And they used to kill Woo! Prince and Prince. Let, <laughs> let, take it from somebody who's from the outside of that camp. When I went to go see them at the Long Beach Arena, I'll never forget. Long Beach Arena, 1984, 85. And the time opened up and, man, they were blazing. They were blazing, like, hard. Just to the point to where I was like, man, you know, like, wow. <laughs> Like, and Prince is really gonna have to, you know, bring it. He brought it, but they just brought a whole nother urban perspective of the show, you know, which was really crazy. And they were killing. They they killed. Wow. But F one five, were they? Were you guys on par? Or do you think they just edged it slightly, or what? what, what, what? Well, as far as what is is what. F one five, when you guys were on this last tour with Latin oh, and F one five, how did? Man, I'm just gonna be quiet. I'm not gonna say anything, man. I would just be quiet. Let's, you know what? Lionel is in a he's in a position where he knows exactly what he wants and he and he does well. His shows are great and they are amazing. He's a consummate performer. He knows how to connect, you know, to the to the crowd and to the people. And he just puts on a great show. But he has a different you know, from my perspective, uh, he has a different crowd than what, you know, Earth, Wind & Fire brings to the table. You know, Lionel can definitely, he brings a little, I, I would say he's more well-rounded because he does have the Commodore background, which yeah, which yeah, really yeah. is heavy R&B. So he brings, he brings a little of that. He doesn't bring a lot of that in the show. He brings a little. I try to pull it out of him to do more, but, you know, he he's got he has a certain crowd that he has to cater to, at which I I get it, and I totally understand. But it's just like when I see Earth Wind killing it, I'm just like, oh man, we can do like, ah, you know, we let's pull this out of the catalog. Let's do this. Let's do that. And he's like, you know, he's like, Booker, here's the deal. 
this is what we're gonna do. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do all of that on the next on the next run. That's what we'll do. But how's that? I'm like, okay, you know. <laughs> How was it watching Verdine on, 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 on bass? Oh man, uh Verdine is killing, man. He's he's a, a killer performer. You know, that's that's what he does, man. He's he's been performing that way since forever, like since the 70s, man. He he's he's high energy, he does his thing. Philip is killing, you know. Wow. Yeah, they just have a great show, man. You know, they're it's really hard to follow Earth, Wind, and Fire. But if anybody's going to do it, I would say that Lionel could definitely do it with with the, his type of catalog that he has, you know. Yeah. And he and he has that catalog. Trust me, he's got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's no, got definitely, it. definitely, definitely. But it's just tough, man. Yeah. When the last five songs that Earth, Wind do are just straight, just <laughs> dance hitters, man. Just all the way from. <laughs> Groove tonight, uh, man. They just they just kill, man. They're killing. Wow. No, well, it's, it's a celebration of, you know. I think one of the things that we've noticed over the last couple of last year or two is when New Edition did the, I think they did the Legacy tour, then they did their Culture tour, and now we've got SWV and Seven or Two. We've got um, an Escape, so we got the Queens of R&B. So we're, it's almost as if R&B and Black music. Is really getting, it's getting, it's you know really being pushed back to the forefront. Big major arena tours and everything. Yeah. Uh, it should have been like that from day one, you know. To me, like R and yeah. music always gets pushed in the background, but that's because I don't even want to really get into it. But that's just the nature of the business and the beast, you know. It that that, that the question to that answer or comment to that answer is a very long one. And it's, and it, I would have to say it's, that would present itself to be an off the camera answer. Because <laughs> what I would say, a lot of people wouldn't like it, but I only speak from, from facts. I only speak from facts and from experience, personal experience. And that's both on stage and off the stage. So it's a lot that goes yeah. that goes with that but i don't want to get into that you know yeah no 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 um, yeah we're, we're gonna um just quick before i mean stevie's gonna come out with with the with the bang and stuff but what's happening with fred hammond because all of a sudden i see him post a video and it sounds a little bit like games remix 2.0 yeah. is that yeah. well you know uh me and fred you know me and fred go way back man since 94 when he was with Commission, and I, what you knew, yeah, I, and I did a song on Commission called "Love Is the Way," and uh, that did very well for them. A lot of people don't know that I produced two songs for for Commission, and it did and it did wow. very well. So, you know, take now, you know, two thousand twenty four. You know, almost thirty years later. You know, and Fred calls me and says, "Hey, man, we." We need a joint, you know, for, for his new project that he's doing. I said, okay. So I figured, you know what, let's let's switch it up a little bit. You know, I'm gonna give him like a a games-ish type, you know, banger, straight R and B, you know, with, with a little, you know, little groove to it. And he put his thing on him and, and Marcus and you know and Keith, they did their thing, and man, it is it's nice, man. It's really nice. It came out even better than what I thought it was going to come out. Wow! Are you featuring on it? Are you singing? I'm not singing on it. I just did. I just did the track. Yeah. Okay. I did the okay. entire uh, track. Wow. Okay. So, any, any idea when it comes out? So oh, as of right now, I know they're they're. I just talked to Fred early this morning, so I know they're mixing it right now. So I have no idea when it's going to drop, but when it does, I will definitely let you know. Okay, now you're saying he's done mixing it. I remember when we talked about spread, spread my wings and we talked about the mix. So, is it you've left the mixing for them? And, and well, what? It, it just depends on who the mixer is. So, I know who the, <laughs> I know who's actually mixing this one, uh, Ray, and he's dope. So, I, I don't have a problem with Ray. Ray is dope. He, he's, <laughs> he's, he's great. He's great. So, I don't have a problem with that. Okay. 
Okay, okay. Stevie, any any favourites of yours? I'm just wondering um, when you had, when you first heard Mark Morrison return of the Mac, how did you feel? Uh, at first, when I first heard it, I was just like, "Wow, okay." I said, "Uh, somebody took my sample." I said, so "The first thing I did was I called my I called my oh. attorney because <laughs> I didn't know it. <laughs> so you know, I'm like, "Oh, wow." And then it comes to find out that he didn't have anything to do with that mix. It was another guy who came, who whom I'm not going to. Mix. Oops. Basically, uh, I'm sorry. You, there, you guys there? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're back. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, we we can see you. Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah, we can see you. Can you, can you hear us? Hello. Can you, can you hear? Yeah, we can see you, Chucky. It's just reconnecting, isn't it? You guys there? Okay. Yeah, we can see you, yeah. Yeah, can you see us? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looks as if... It just froze for a second. Uh -huh. I'll wait until he comes on. Um, looks as if he's frozen for a second. Does he need to press press V on his his camera? Um, no, I'm not sure. Let me. I brought him back in. It looks as if he's frozen. Okay. Um, oh, that's just oh, I've got the wrong background. Just as he's getting into it as well. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he he will. Um, but he'll be back soon. You, you're so. losing us now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, yeah. Okay. He'll come back soon. There he is. <laughs> yeah. He'll, I'll switch you back in. So he may. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear us now? Yeah. I got you. I couldn't hear you at first. Just yeah. kind of, I don't know what happened there. Yeah. No, that's fine. No. So Steve was asking about uh, the, Mark yeah, the Mark Morrison <laughs> track. Right, right, right. So yeah, and you I mean, calling an attorney or something. Yeah, I called my attorney and he says, "Okay." He says, "I'm on it." So, uh, it just so happens that the guy who actually—that's actually a remix because the actual record version is not. No, it was called Father and Joe, the C and J guys from I think it was Denmark who did the remix. Yeah, yeah. They, they obviously being DJs will have heard would have heard games. <laughs> Oh and yeah, and probably thought let's use that. So I was just yeah. interested because with with Chucky Bucket from your '92 album, it was like you kind of went missing. It was like I wonder what Chucky thinks of this. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I thought it was great. You know, as long as I get a piece of it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not mad. You want a sample? I'm all for it. That's great. You know. Just give give me what you know my my uh, my my just do as I say so it's all right. I mean pre pre your first album in the eighties, from say the mid eighties to the late eighties, you seem to do quite a bit of stuff, whether it be playing on something or writing something or producing something. I'm trying to convince Namdi because we do a new Jack Swing podcast, yeah. not just to go for the big bigger well known artists, but we needed to get. The histories of, of a lot of the the forgotten artists or the, you know, the unsigned artists. artists. <laughs> um, <laughs> can we start? Can we start with these teas oh! and this guy as well, Kipper Jones, who obviously was part of this group. That is my guy. Can you tell us tell us about this and M two makers. Obviously, M two May was a big part of this album. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah that, memory for that. Yeah, that particular record, which is really crazy, uh, that album, I actually was gone by then. Wow. I, I left the group by that time, that that record, because uh, I went to go ahead and, and pursue my own career as far as, you know, doing uh, production and writing. And, uh, you know, I, and I love all the guys, you know, like I said, Kipper's my guy. You know, and he understood, you know, because there was a lot of turmoil and, and at the time with the group. A couple of the members, you know, fell out and they left. And, you know, it was just it was really uh, just a 
crazy situation at that time. So I decided to leave. However, when they started that record, uh, they got into it. Kipper, they, they were actually recording it in New Jersey, in East Orange, New Jersey, uh, with him too, May. And Kipper called me and said, hey, man, look, we're doing this record. Uh, M2 May has his keyboard players and a lot of his guys, but it just, you know, and they're great. He says, but they don't have that funk, that's that swing, man. And man, we need you to come out. And, you know, Kipper, you know, I, man, I, I would never turn that down, man. If Kipper said, hey, you want me to come out? I'll be there. As long as the other cats are cool with it, I'm there. And so, sure enough, uh, I came out. We had a great time. I, I worked with M2 May, who was great. You know, he did his thing, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And, yeah, the rest is history. There was a label as well. I know it's an independent label at the time. Is it KMA? And there's an uh, album, Copper. Yeah, I, yeah, really, I was also... Yeah, who I was also because that again, to me, listening to that, it's very pre-New Jack. Yes, you know a lot of fun. Absolutely, New Jack as well. But who was she? Just, just gone, disappeared. Yeah, well, KMA Records. Uh, that was Copper. Uh, they, they had quite a few uh, artists on that label. KMA Records was actually a, uh, it was a production company out of San Fernando Valley, California, at the time. Uh, they were called Jam Power Records. Okay. And I was like one of the chief producers for that company wow. at the time. At the same time I was working with them, I was also working with T's, and I was also uh, <laughs> signed to Unlimited Gold Records, which was my godfather's record label, which was the main reason why I couldn't really uh, sign with T's at the time, because I was already committed to working with my godfather. Uh, so, I, you know, again, I, I had so many things on the table working at that time. And to this day, I'm the same way. I just, I like to work, man. I love music and I want to have my hands in the cookie jar as much as I can, you know, because that's just who I am. I've always been, I've been built like that. It's in my DNA. And what happened to Copper though? Was she, did she ever get, did any, were any major labels interested in her? It's just... I've, just wondering you know, why, really. I don't know what Copper, um, with her management, had at the time. She was, at that time, she was very huge in, in L.A., especially with the uh, the, the radio station uh, Power 106. They She had a song called Second to None, which I produced. And <laughs> it, it went number one, you know, on the radio stations there at the time. It was a big, big song. It was a dance record. Mm -hmm. uh, did very well. She had a lot of great songs, uh, but again, I don't know the the business aspect of it with her, with the record company and the management, whether or not if she had any interest. But by but but looking at how they played her records in L.A. at the time on the big radio stations, I would have to uh, guess that she did have to have some type of interest, you know. But I'm just not sure, you know, if if it you know followed through. There was there was another group as well. Again, very obscure. They made two albums called Chill. Who were them yeah. guys? Yes. Wow, man, you're going back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chill, again, was part of the same label. Uh, I worked with them as well. I worked with almost every artist on that record label. Uh, Chill was great, man. They had a lot of... Uh, had a lot of talent, a lot of creativity. Uh, the biggest record I did for them was a song called 16 uh, that did really well. Again, I, I did the entire track and I just kind of brought the guys in and, you know, sung and produced the, the vocals and whatnot. It was more of a kind of a time kind of feel, you know, the time, Morris Day and the time feel, but it, it did really well for them. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm looking at the way your, your sound developed and it did. I'm just thinking, was you, did you have an eye on what Teddy was doing over on the East Coast? Because it, it no. did, you know, you, you sounded developing to a bit of a swing, you know? Yeah, it, yeah. What's, you know, what's really funny about that is um, I respect Teddy, you know, for what he did. He, he actually created that new Jack Swing thing. Uh, 
And a lot of people put me in that era when they hear uh, Turned Away. They're like, oh, that's New Jack. And I'm like, no, it's not New Jack. It's Go Go. Mm -hmm. That is a Go Go beat that I basically took that vibe. Go Go, because I'm a big Go Go fan. So you know, with the go, you know, with the gogo bells and the congas and the and the feel of it was was more or less it was go go and not new jack, you know. But since you know, I came out during that era, that time of new jack swing, they just said, "Oh, it's new jack," but no, it's not. Who was who was this guy? Dude, oh Paul. man, looking wow. a bit like Millie Vanilli, bit of a Millie, you, bit of Terrence Trent Darby. Wow, now you, that's that's. Yeah, that was my buddy DuPont. He was on MCA Records. Now, it's funny that you said Milli Vanilli because he was the background singer for Milli Vanilli at the time when he got his deal at MCA. Wow, I didn't know that. Yes. Wow. And, and he sung background with him for quite a few years. Wow. So what happened to him then? Obviously, he seemed to disappear after this album. You know, man, it, it's just... It's hard to say, you know, because at that time he was signed to uh, uh, with MCA Records. Uh, God, who was that? I, I can't. Oh, uh, Lil Silas was Lil the uh, Silas main was guy. Right. Yeah, was the main okay. guy at MCA. He called me and says, "Hey, I just signed this kid who sings background with Millie Vanilli." He says, "I really believe in him. I need a, you know, I need a, a funk jam for him, you know." <laughs> and so. And what's funny about that was this song that I did on him called Hurricane was actually a song that I did on Copper yes. prior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prior to, you know, to DuPont. And uh, he heard, he loved the song. He heard it. And he said, man, he says, you did this song called Hurricane. And he says, but no one else, you know, it, it didn't really get any attention. But he says, I would love to redo it, to recut it. And I said, sure. So this that's what I did. There's a guy, as on a lot of the stuff you've kind of produced or wrote, there's another guy who always springs up, and I know you know him. And again, we don't know whether he's reluctant to come on, come on the. <laughs> we really want to get him on the show. It's a guy called D. Levance. I don't know if I. D. Levance, yeah. dude. This unsung yeah. legend. Nobody, I don't know. He doesn't seem to any interviews. He's produced so much stuff, had his, his own sound like you did. Yes. Any really story. We need that guy's story, you know. Guess what? I just had a a, a surprise unsung party for me in LA, and D. Levant just came and showed up, and we chopped <laughs> it up for a while. So yeah, I'm I'm in contact with him. I can I can be more than happy to oh. pass him on. You know why? Because from an LA perspective, of that guy is seriously talented. Like he's just like me in a lot of ways. He plays every instrument. He can sing. He plays bass. He's a great bassist, man. He can really play his butt off, and he's a great performer. And there's a big story behind uh, D. Levance that a lot of people don't know, uh, how I met him. And we also played together when I was on the road with the Osley Brothers. He played and danced with the Osley Brothers at the time. Wow. This was 93, 94. So we have a lot of history, man. But we actually met at the Inglewood Talent Show back when he was like 16 i was like 18 or 19 and uh that he, he was gonna perform in the show but he didn't have a band so i was the md of the house band at the time and he came up to me and said hey man uh he says i want to perform uh but i don't have a band so i was wondering if you guys knew any of michael jackson songs i said yeah what do you want to do he said i want to do lady of my life and billy <gasps> jean Wow. So, of course, my guys knew the song. I said, let's do it. I'll just follow you. You sing it and just look at me and we'll follow it. There were like 20 people in the talent show, and he did those two songs, killed it. He ended up winning the talent show. Wow. And, and we've been in touch ever since. Because wow. he did, he, he put an album out back then. I, I love the album, but again, it just, it just seemed to be Great record. Yeah. And again, he was signed to MCA Records. Uh, he just he just never got you know the the recognition that he deserved. But he is incredibly talented, man. When I tell you he's incredibly talented, he just never really got the break that he deserved. Yeah, we need his story, which leads on because he did he did some stuff on this as well as you did. Yes. Like, again, can you tell me about these girls? Great looking girls at the time. They had a great yes. album. Some really good up tempo tracks on this. Are you available? Come yes. and get it. 
So my favorite. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're new jack to me. I know you probably, but <laughs> they fit in a new jack set to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's funny? They were also signed to MCA Records, aka, you know, also coming from Lou Silas. Uh, Lou had a, such a great amount of talent over there at MCA. They were just popping, man. Mm -hmm. And again, Lou called me and says, hey, we need a couple of bangers, uh, you know, from you. And they are, they were really talented, young, could sing, great. Uh, yeah, Stacey and Kimmy go, wow, that's going back, man. You, people who collect this stuff, we, we've just, you know, we, we just, because at the time there was obviously no internet, you, you might see a review in a magazine or you might yeah. hear, hear the record on the radio and, and that was it, you know? Yeah. I'm trying to think of Callaway. I believe you did some stuff with Callaway. Yeah, they had a song they called I Wanna, uh, uh, Yeah, I, they had a uh, number one record called I Want to Be Rich. That uh, was huge at the time. I do remember that being yeah. huge at the time. Well, I was in the studio uh, in Glendale, California. I was actually working with Angela Wimbush. Wow. And they were in Studio A. I was in Studio B working with Angela. Uh, I did a song on her called Treat You Right. And I just happened to walk by and I saw Reggie and Sino in the studio. And they they go, hey, you're just the guy we were looking for. You know, we need some synth parts on this song, man. I'm like, oh, OK. So I just I walked in the studio and I said, play it back once. Played it back. Run the, you know, go ahead, run the tape. Did it one take and then I had to leave and went back to my session. <laughs> I mean, while you were doing all these 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 bits, was was you actually signed to Atlantic by then? Was you you know was you was you getting calls? Come produce this, that, way yeah. on this. What what was going on? Yeah, yeah, I was signed with Atlantic. Yes, at the time, yeah, I was signed with Atlantic. Wow. Who else? This. I mean, again, you worked on Cool and the Gang. Oh yeah! Wow, man, dude, man, you're pulling up some archives. Raindrops. Raindrops. Big, you know. Again, forgotten track. The story. This story about spread my wings. About you. The version you you did didn't get used. It was yeah. Right. All right. All done. Right. Because I've got the CD single here. Yeah. This and it's got. It says on this CD single, original. It says the original mix edit on this CD single. Would that be your mix? No. No. It's the original version, but it was not mixed by me. Right. Yeah. All ah, right. So, this, yeah. These never, these CD singles, they never came out properly, did they? They were just sent to no. radio. I figured that. Yeah, just radio. On, yeah. Mix on there. Um, <laughs> I mean, this was a bit later on, going into the nineties. But Vesta, ah, I love this woman. Vesta. I love Vesta. You just posted a video yeah. about her, didn't you? I did. That's really funny that I just posted a because you know, today is my happy Vesta day. You know, mm. so I, I was it, was it her choice to do outstanding, or was it something you suggested? The cover of Gap Band. Actually, that was her idea. We were in the studio. Uh, I was recording some songs for for that particular record. We did about four or five joints that were just killing, man. That were just really nice. And she says, "You know what?" She says, "I always wanted to do, you know, a remake of Uncle Charlie's song, you know, with Outstanding." So I said, "Well, let me come up with a, a vibe for it." And she said, "Well, I don't want it to be like the original, of course." I said, "Well, no, no, you're talking to the right guy. I'll flip it." <laughs> so, <laughs> so I flipped it, and then again. The same thing happened to me. What happened with uh, True happened to me on that particular project. I did the song, I did the mix, and then the guy at, the, at that time says, "Oh, this is great, but I want to make a street version of it." So he totally went in, remixed the song, totally not anything that I did, <clears throat> and he was about to put on here, produced by me, Chucky, and I'm like. Bro, if you don't take my name off that record right now and change it and put your name on it, wow. then I said, we're going to have a problem. So I had to make them change it because it was totally like not anything that I did on the mix. And they totally did not put my mix on the record. Wow. Another yeah. one. 
Yeah, record companies, those 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 uh AR guys back then were really shady, man. Super shady. You know, they, they want to get their hands on the pie or to get a piece of the cut any way they can. But again, I had to assert myself because they would have never done that with like Teddy or Jimmy Jam or Terry Lewis or anybody of that nature. But yet you don't want to you want to do it to me. No, I command a little bit more respect than that. So you're gonna have to change that, partner. You're gonna have to change the, those credits and put your name on it. And yeah, so I mean, vocally in the studio, uh, she's got an incredible voice. Oh, is it like li being in the studio and listen to her putting her vocals down? Her her vocals, man. She is so amazing. Like I literally of that song on Outstanding, we did five takes. Wow. And the first one, I was ready to go. I was like, the first take that you hear on that album, well, my mix. Actually, my mix, I don't know who, po somebody posted the original mix that I did on Vesta on YouTube. So it's actually there. The mix that I did is on there. It's not the one on the album because the album is the other guy's mix. But that, that mix that you hear was her very first take. And she didn't stop. She just said, let me sing it all the way through. And that's the mix that you, the, the verse that you hear was that one. And I was good after that. I said, okay, all right, Vivi. I used to call Vesta Vivi. I would say, Vivi, that's it. Let's shut it down. She's like, no, no, no. She's like, no, no, no. Let me do a couple more. I'm like, no, Vesta, that's it. That's <laughs> but she wanted to do four more. And I ended up using that first one. And she was happy with it. But for those of us who aren't uh, musically inclined, what does that mean by mix, different mix? Because I guess. Well, a mix is basically like me sitting down with the engineer and telling them like, okay, these are all the parts that I produced and that I wrote and that uh, pretty much I tell the engineer sonically what I need. Like I need a little bit more of this, a little bit more of the drums, or I need less of this, or put a little bit more high end on the vocals, or lush this out. Uh, don't make this too, you know, bring up the snare, turn down the kick drum. So I'm basically mixing the actual record. So when somebody comes in and takes the tracks that I made, they might completely change the entire track and say, oh, we're going to get another producer to come in and do a whole nother version, which is what they did for the video version of Spread My Wings. That wasn't my mix, actually. It was my vocals and some of my production, but that was Clark Kent who actually did the remix for the video. That I was cool with, because it was a total, that that was great. I, I enjoyed that. I loved it. But when my manager told me like, oh no, Chucky, they're going to use your mix for the album, but for the video, they're going to use a street mix. I'm like, okay, cool. So that was actually the downfall of my manager at that time because he told me they're going to use your mix. And when the record came out, they used this other guy's mix. So I'm like, dude, just give me your word. If you, if you say what it's going to be, it's going to be. And it, it wasn't. So that in itself, see, us as producers and writers, you know, this is all we have. This is our integrity, is our music, is our sound. That's all we have. We have nothing else. So if you go and change that without our consent or the record company allows to do that, then, you know, that, that nothing else matters at that point. I mean, so I say apart from mastering, could you could you do a whole song up to producing and the mix? And then would you have to send it off for mastering or could you actually master the record as well i could master if i wanted to you could do the whole thing then do everything wow i mix master make do all the music i do everything so you know but just by the sake of okay i'm signed with the you know to work with the record company the record company actually has to say so and the power to do with it what they want at that time yes of course i could master but when you do an entire record or, or an album, you want to keep it consistent. So you, of course, you would have to bring a, a mastering technician to come in to master the entire record so it so it's consistent throughout from the first song to the last. I understand that and I get that. So I had no issues with that at all. I think we for quite a while now, I think we're going through an epidemic of badly mastered records. Yeah. 
you know. I agree. That trap. I don't know whether that distortion on on the bass in a lot of the trap sounds is supposed to be like that, but I'm not so, having it personally. I'm not. I, it just sounds. It sounds unmastered to me. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. It, it's. I think it's just in the eye of the, the ear of the, as I say, the ear of the beholder. Mm -hmm. You know, it's basically whatever the record company wants. You know, and, and what they feel and what they need, what they feel is to what can make a hit record. You know, because at the bottom line, at the end of the day, it's all about making money to them. They really don't care who you are as a producer, writer, artist. If it's something where they feel they can make money and push their agenda and their narrative, that's all that matters. I mean, there's a lady, she's still going strong today. You did a lot of work with Layla Hathaway. Can you remember Layla. those sessions? And, and Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and if you don't know this by now, Layla is like by far my favorite vocalist, male or female. Wow. Um, wow. Because um, just the, the inflections that she has, you know, she has inflections of her dad, you know, but yet she still carries a lot of her own uh a lot of her own inflections uh i'm a big fan of hers and always have been uh since day one and i don't know if i told this to nabi or not nabi or not but the first time my manager sent me uh a cassette tape i was in the studio uh i was working uh in the studio and he says i want you to listen to this he didn't even tell me who it was he just said listen to this and it had her name on the top i remember it said layla from chicago it didn't even have her hat her last name i just said layla from chicago he says this and he knew who it was but he didn't want to tell me he just said i want you to listen to this and then you tell me and i'll never forget this i i put the cassette in i press play and I heard her vocals. It was like this jazz song. And I cried. I literally cried like, oh my God. I said, she sounds like a female Donnie Hathaway, but she has this whole nother air about her, the, the texture of her voice, the tone of her voice, the way she sung it really made you feel like what she's singing about she really meant what she was saying more than anything. And I cried. And I immediately, I called my, my, my uh, manager and I said, man, I said, this girl sounds like, she sounds like, like, like she listened to like a lot of Donnie Hathaway. And he just laughed. He just laughed. Was, okay. Well, he said, that is the daughter of Donnie Hathaway. Wow. I just like, wow. Wow. I was already a big fan of Donnie. You know, I grew up with his music. My mother played his first album, Everything is Everything, in the house as a kid. I was like nine years old, 10 years old at the time. And, and uh, she would play that record every day. And my mother would just sit and she would just listen to it. And I could just tell, my mother's a musician. So she would listen to that. and. I was too young to really understand it, but I just knew that she was into it. So if she was into it, that means, okay, this dude must be something really serious. Cause my mom is just, I've never heard my mother listen to any other gospel record or any record there before or after like she did Donnie. So to me as a kid, I'm like, okay, he, he's, 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 he's the real deal, whatever it is. Cause it's making my mom sit down and listen. Yeah. Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. she's in the UK. She's loved by by like the soul community. There was, she's loved, uh, you know. Mm. Go on, sorry, carry on. Yeah, no, we've no. got John John from Troop. John John is uh, watching live. John John, that's my boy. John came. John John came down to the uh, unsung party. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I love John John. It was, um, <laughs> that's my boy. There was another guy who, who picks up a lot of radio play in the early 90s at the time. I had a big, big voice. You could relate yeah. it to Barry White. Signed oh. to RCA. Yes, Mr. sir. Gene Rice. What, what, was, what was Gene Rice's story and how did you end up working with him? 
G, man, G has a big vo a huge voice, man. Jeez. When I first heard G, um, I said, man, he's got a mixture of like a Teddy Pendergrass, you know, mixed with a a little bit of BW, a, a higher registered BW. He just had this real big voice, man. Uh, and uh, he came by the studio. His manager said, hey, man, we want you to work with him. And, you know, we want you to write something original for him. You know, he was doing a lot of covers at the time. So we did this song called Come a Little Closer. And it, it came out great, man. Gene was such a nice guy. Yeah, super creative, which I dug. It felt like to me from about 92, even towards the tail end of 91, 92, that major labels were bailing out on big big male vocalists. They were. They just no. kind of just zoop <laughs> right out the picture. Just zoop right out. And he, he kind of, he kept, you know, they signed him. He kept going for a few years for a couple of albums, you know, but great voice. Great voice. Incredible voice. Going back to your your first album, okay. you signed to Atlantic Records. Bobby Brown was obviously a huge, you know, by 89, Bobby Brown was, was the talk of the industry. Yeah. Was there pressure on you, signed as an R&B artist, to not just... Were they looking for a Bobby Brown Atlantic? I, I don't know because you are obviously you could make that sound. Was it? Did you feel any of that? No, uh, no pressure on my end because I already knew what I wanted. I, I didn't want to be focused on as being a, like an artist, even though they tried to push me that way. Like, hey, we want you to have a couple of dancers go out there and do the <laughs> the routines and all that, which I did. You know, I could. I mean, I, I had a little rhythm, so I could dance a little. You know, but. You know, they were trying to, I think, mold me into that, into that character. But uh, for me, it was I was really just focused on being a producer. You know, that that was my that 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 was my strong point, and I really tried to focus on that. You know, so I didn't have any pressure. It's funny because what you're saying about you making albums and you see yourself more as a producer, maybe a songwriter. There's a similar guy. Do you know a guy? Have you heard a guy called Gardner Cole? He was a songwriter. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I interviewed him once. Yeah. I wanted his story and he said the same yeah. thing. He said he 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 said he felt Warner Brothers pushed him into mate. He didn't really want to make the art. He didn't really want to be a solo artist. He just wanted to be a songwriter and do yeah. some playing. But you, you know, yeah. get another guy who's completely unsung, but so unsung. You, I mean, for the fans, we love these these two. We love these two albums. You know, even that's crazy. Say, that's so crazy to me. You know? Look, you know, we cherish these. You know, that's what I really dig about uh, you guys. Uh, you know, your the, the way you guys uh, really focus and and honor and and really look after R&B musicians in that era in that that timeline you, you guys are just so appreciative man and it makes us you know it just makes us feel you know honored man and, and just i really really respect you guys for that because they don't do an ounce of that here wow if, at all they don't do not even a half ounce of that you know if an older or seasoned artist comes out with something and they put it on instagram the first thing people do is they go and say, man, look at this old dude looking like so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. And it's just all, they, they talk bad about him. They just talk bad all the way down to say, oh, he needs to give it up. He needs to retire. Or he, you know, and it's just, it's just bad. That's why I really don't focus too much on on social media too much because it's just all negativity, especially in the R&B and the, and the, uh, the, 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 the black, African-Americans, yeah. whatever call it indigenous people the majority of those people are just completely negative just negative it's a shame so yeah i mean i think one of the things it is i mean it, it is a shame. and i know that you 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 were so big to you know, and you've said in the phone your interview about you wanted to focus on the music and write and, and produce um but then what people were saying is like man but the the the, the songs themselves were hits, they were amazing, turn around, and it's upbeat and joyful. So, um, hence, there's that sense of, man, we wish we could see Chucky perform his stuff. 
Um, but I, and I guess you know, and I know you had your experiences with, with with the labels and stuff. But I think that there's a lot of us who miss that side of the Chucky, the performer, the the guy who was you know did a little guitar solo in in uh, on an army track, which wasn't you know, apart from Prince, we weren't getting that much of, of that stuff. And you were yeah. doing the, your dance moves and stuff as well. Yeah, you know, I I, I do miss it, you know, uh, but again, at that particular time when Prince was doing the solos and things of that nature, when I came out, I made it a point, like I didn't want to play guitar. I didn't want to do guitar solos and that because then the first thing people would say was like, oh, this dude, he's just trying to be Prince. You know, he's trying to, you know, play the guitar. So I made it a point to say, you know what? I'm going to back off of that. You know, I, I don't want people to try to make those comparisons or, you know, because there is no comparison. When you think of Prince is in a whole nother stratosphere. So I'm not even going to try to compete with that. It's like, you know, that, that dude is just, you know, what I'm saying? your own sound, your own vocal sound, your own, yeah. your own productions. It, I never, it, never even considered that when I was listening. Did you even Namde? No, I always no. thought it was this is Chucky. This is your sound. America's US is just a whole other can of worms, guys. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, when I first heard spinning from the second album, I thought you'd use the ping pong ball on, on the snare beat, you know. <laughs> I listened to it again. I, yeah, it just sounded like a ping pong ball. I, I'd yeah. never heard that before, but I could I could tell by the way you did your snare beat. Because Teddy had his own style, he had his own like reverse snare sound, didn't it? Yeah. But yeah. you, I was listening to the snare. You put other things on it as well, you know. Yeah, I just like again, I, I'm a creative person, so I like to do something different than what other people are doing because that's how you stand out. Yes. You know, I was taught that from my godfather at a very early age. He says, "You don't want to copy anybody. You want to be a trendsetter." He said, "If somebody's going left, go right. If somebody's going right, go left." Because you're going to stand out. It's going to keep you working if you stay original and stay creative. And guess what? 35, 40 years later, I'm still here. So he was right. He was right about a lot of things, actually. But in that sense, he was right because I'm still working. I'm still here. There were yeah. some questions earlier on, Namdi, from some of the, the viewers. Some about, is it the gents? Did you do concept? Track called concept? Yeah. Yeah. It came out as a 12 inch single, so yes, who, who yeah. were them guys? Well, th those are all my buddies. We, we, uh, we, uh, we had a, they were also a part of the uh production company called Jam Power. And uh, back in you know, I was telling you that way yeah. back, they were part of the, the same company that Copper was a part of, and that uh, the couple of the guys in the group were like my best, you know, they were like my best friends, so. Uh, they say, hey, we're going to put this group together. You know, we're not really singer singers, but, you know, they look, they had the look, they had the image. And uh, so I say, well, you know, let's, let's try something. You know, you guys have the opportunity. Let's put something together. So we did the gents and they did their thing and ended up, the song was heard by uh, John, God, what's John McClain over at AM Records. Oh my God! Executive, God heard it, and he called the the the, the leader of the guy, the, the the owner of the company, and says, "Hey, uh, I want this group over at A and M. Wow. But in order to get the group over, I want to sign the producer who signed it at the time." And he was like, uh, "The owner was like, uh, no way, you're not going to get Chucky in the deal. I'll get, <laughs> I'll get it." Chucky. And he was like, well, I don't want the deal then. He says, I don't want the album deal. I don't want it. If you, if I can't get Chucky to sign with them, I don't want I don't want him. So finally, they came up with the thing where they would do a singles deal. And they did the one single and blah, 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 whatever. And then, yeah. So that's how the gents happened. It was just me and the guys were just sitting around. We tried to find five guys that had this, this male kind of... Uh, stripper you know look you know these they were all like five real good looking guys you know so that's that's how we came up with the gents i mean was there anything else i mean in terms of like untold stories or from a collector's point of view did you work on that never came out or some major label artists that 
you did a session with and it just didn't happen or is there any anything you can tell us there any secrets man uh well i mean yeah I, yeah i really can't say there is a couple of things but i'll have to get clearance first before i can talk about it <laughs> there is a couple of projects that we did that i did with a couple of guys that was going to be really big really huge but in order for me to speak about it i would have to clear it with them okay I'm very yeah, we, I'm we are going to get your i don't know I, i've missed this but how are we going to get your whether it's a remake or you re, are we going to hear your version of spread spread my wings no 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 that's only for live purposes only so if you oh were to put another album out, couldn't you do redo it as a bonus track for us fans? I mean, could, but I'm not. <laughs> We've got a question from Colin. It says, can you actually out of the dock from the second album? Was it influenced by Duran Duran, especially the no. breakdown song? Wow, that's interesting. Duran Duran, wow. yeah, And I love Duran Duran, by the way. But no, that song, actually, that out, song Out of the Dark was actually something that I cut on the first album and it had the same feel as Don't You Know I Love You. So it was like, again, it was between those two songs, which one will I put on the record? I ended up putting Don't You Know I Love You on the first record. And then the second album, Out of the Dark was mentioned, but I totally reflipped the drums and changed some of the instrumentation. So yeah, but I was just something that I just came up with. That's more of a Stevie Wonder uh, influence, to be honest with you. Um, what did you, did you, was Jackie doing backgrounds on, on any of your tracks on Nice and Wild, Jack McGee? Yeah, he sung background on, <clears throat> on Deep Sea Diver. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I love Jackie. She, she, she's one of our faves. <laughs> Many times on on the uh, halftime chat, aren't you, Namdi? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, I love Jack. I saw her recently dancing Jackie, to one of your tracks. <laughs> Jackie's amazing, man. She has such a great quality and tone in her voice, and and secondly, she's kind of like Vesta. She is crazy. She is wild. <laughs> this is funny. Yeah. She says up all the time. Jackie said, "Just have me cracking up in the studio." She's you said funny. you produced his sophomore album, which got shelved by MCA. You, you produced a track on that. Yeah, that's right. I, I did a song uh, called Something's On Your Mind. And I did a couple of other remixes for her record. And then I think right when it was about to come out, I think that's when she got dropped, I think, from the label. I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, MCA, you talked about MCA. I mean, they had... They had Bobby, they had New Edition, Tons BBD, they had they had the whole Uptown record stuff, they, Joey Wat Watley, then they had, they, it was just Tons like, of talent. Tons of talent. By far. Crazy talent. But yeah. what about what about the West Coast? To me, back then, the West Coast, we got, obviously we're going to the sound in New Jack Swing, but okay. it had okay. its own sound. It did have its own sound. The Zutons, yes. What's that guy from the Zutons? It, um... West Coast sound. Now, what what part of the air you mean? Like the middle eighty, late eighties, nineties? Set your sound. There was D. Levance. There was True oh, yeah. Sound. Z. Look. Yeah. Z. Look. Yeah. Z. Look. Yeah. I guess yeah, it was yeah. more funky, you know. I guess it was more of a funky, it's funky more, sound. Funky. Yeah, it, I think a lot of it had the the Minneapolis flavor. A lot, of, you know, everything at that time had the Minneapolis flavor to it. But I think we really focused on more like the buzzy synth bass, more the busier synth bass lines, and and kind of the the digital, you know, the synth horns more. Uh, yeah, I think that we we definitely had a sound, you know, but it was really derived all from that. You know, Minneapolis flavor. You know, it, it took its own course, and yeah. Well, was it an effort to sound different from New York? Because you had what Teddy was doing, and he had. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, no, when Teddy came out, when Teddy hit, it was just like lights out for everything else at the time. Because New Jack just took its own, you know, course, man. It just really blew up. It really did. But as a musician, um, how do you then? 
try and create your own sound because like Prince, you know, you talk about Minneapolis and that was based on Prince and a lot of musicians leading that sound. The New York sound was was very much sample based. You know, we had that whole James Brown and stuff. So, of course, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, did you and you did you then think about just you know, focusing on on staying in, in that lane? And I think LA and Babyface had moved out to the West Coast, and they were they didn't yeah. they seemed to be different from the New Jack as well. You know, I I was just I didn't really focus on it, on any genre per se. Uh, I just only went with what I felt, you know, was in my head. Like, I just want to be different, you know. So whatever it took for me to be different from this producer or this writer or this musician, that's what I was going to do. I just I just wanted to be different. I just didn't want to fall into that category of just being your, you know, the average, you know, new jack or, mus or just musician, period, you know. Yeah. Can you tell us about your uh, uh, Steve and I have one of our favorite producers that we, we, we're still trying to get on the show. What makes David Foster such a unique producer? <laughs> Oof, man. Yeah. He is you talk about the ultimate producer and musician wow. who had the pleasure to work with, I mean, in the in his own home, you know, he invited me and we sat and we worked and we played and we uh, recorded songs together. I worked with a lot of his artists. Man, I would probably say that's probably the only time I really fanned out, wow. but he didn't know it. He didn't know it. <laughs> I had to be cool. <laughs> But, but that was the only time I, I fanned out, man, because I really saw, I already knew how talented, you know, he was and, and his production and his writing, but to actually see it like in a working environment, that really did it for me, man. It, it took my game up another level, to be honest with you. Wow. Because, yeah, because I mean, I, you know, a lot of us creative musicians uh you know you have to have a certain air about you you have to have a certain bravado about what you do and who you are you know or else you just won't be heard you won't be seen i'm really not one of those guys that do that and you would i i would never have the i could never have the, the kanye west you know air about me i'm not mm -hmm. gonna speak on what I do and, and who I am and who I worked with and all this crazy stuff. That's just not me. That's not, that's not who I am. But when you're around somebody like David Foster and then people ask you like, who have you worked with and who do you, you know, kind of cater yourself after, man, I'm the first one to fan out. I'll be, I'm like, Hey, David Foster is that dude. He is uh -huh. that guy. And if I want to be like anybody, it'd be like him. But he brings a lot of balance. So what, you know, see, you, you, you want to be like even... David Foster. <laughs> you wouldn't think there'd be the similarities because he's a very, you know, orchestra balance and both back rack kind of stuff. Yeah. But then, you, you you know, you bring funk. I mean, well, I would have thought you're like a modern you know, Prince 2.0 with, with that type yeah. of sound. So it seems like two different... But you know what? Genres and styles of music change dramatically, you know? I would have to say this is the only genre this era, this this era of the year of this type of music, we know with the you know, without the, the same fast, you know, high hats. That's this has lasted a long time. You know, it's nothing hasn't changed, you know, it's just for the last 10, 15 years, music has really hasn't really changed. But in that era of the time. Uh, music is just, I mean, so many different variables. And I think what 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 David did, what Jimmy and Terry did, mm -hmm. is by far to me has been the the most in influential sound of that time. And it cannot be replicated or duplicated by it any be the, the master of the master of soundtrack themes uh, during the 80s. Yeah. He's, he got a yeah. lot of work, didn't he? Doing, doing theme, you know. But Dan Warren writing, and he, you know, he. David, David Foster, his his range, 
And his style of music is a lot bigger than what people think. It's not just orchestration and big sounds and big soundtracks. He's done a lot of big records that you would not believe that he wrote and produced. And literally one, a lot of people don't know, he did Cheryl Lynn's song, To Be Real, Got To Be Real. That's David Foster. A lot of people don't know that. The what you find. Uh, uh. No, you've got to give me props for that. I've got to give you props for that. His range is crazy, which is why well, I... There was also a lot of, let, let's have it right, in the 80s, there was a lot of schmaltzy ballads was, that you have to get your sleeping bag out for. You know, you, know, you get the sleeping bag out. Like Michael Massa was another name. It's like, oh, get yeah. the, let's get the sleeping bag out here, guys. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I'm falling yeah. asleep here. Oh, but, I, you know, if I, saw, but if I saw David Foster name, and long, especially if he had someone like Dan Warren writing for him, I knew there was going to be a safe song. Of um, course. Yeah, and it was going to be but He did stretch out. He, he did stretch out in, in the later, you know, in the later part of his, his production career. Like when he actually hired me to, to work with him, he, would, he worked on a song for Brandy. He produced a song on Brandy called One Voice on her Never Say Never album, which he called me to come in to, I, I did some uh, guitar and, and did some uh, uh, drum programming and and some of the, you know, some of the keys and stuff, but that's the song I've worked with him on that just like, man, this dude. And I could tell he was trying to bring in a little bit more different genre of style of sound, which is why he brought me in. Cause he says, hey, I still want to be myself. I still want to be David, but I want to have a little edge to it, you know, from today's sound. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just to see him work like that, yeah, he's very in tune with what was going on, very much so. And that's why his career is the way that it is, because he stayed open to being creative in all aspects. Uh, DJ Lex, did you ever cross paths with Chaka, Chaka Khan? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've crossed paths. We've talked about, it's so funny, because every time when I, talk to Shaka. I did a song way, 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 way back in the day that I actually had originally wrote for uh, for Shanice. And, mm. and Shaka heard the song and she said, Chucky, I want to do this song so bad. And we've always tried to get together to do this record, but we just never got around to it. You know, we just never, never got around to it. You know, and every time when we bump into each other, you know, we always say, hey, we got to do that song. You know? <laughs> oh, come on, it's been 35 years. She still thinks about that record that I did. <laughs> did you do the track for Tales from the Crib? I did. I, I, not not the rap, not the Tales and Crib rap. Or it's like a, it's like a funky, funky new Jack horror record, as I, as I remember. Yeah, I did the uh, the the uh, the title of the soundtrack for the Tales of the Crypt. Uh, yeah, the Tales of the Crypt soundtrack. I I did a song. Uh, this is the Crypt Jam. That was the name of the Crypt Jam. I was like, okay, okay. I, Voice with that was this uh, voice actor named John Kassir. He is really talented. But I wrote the entire rap and I just said, hey, John, do it like this. And he's like, yeah, I, you know, and he nailed it. Like first take. <laughs> yeah, we used to love watching that when I was, yeah, I, I went to college in the States. So yeah, that was so. Yeah. That was so. Yeah. Yeah, how was it like, uh, uh, Stephanie's asked, how was it like working with Jared Albright? Oh, man, that's some of the best times I've ever had, man, as far as just being a musician. And, mm -hmm. and, and Ger Gerald is, again, he's one of those unsung type musicians. I mean, producer, writer. First of all, when I first saw Gerald, you know, as a musician, he was on tour with Anita Baker. This was in 1986 for the Cool Jazz Festival. I we were opening up for Anita Baker uh, for the Cool Jazz Festival I, with Tease. I was part of Tease, and one of the guys in the band knew about Gerald. I didn't know who he was, but he said, "You got to watch this guy. He's incredible." So when I first saw Gerald, he was playing bass. What? And it was killing. 
he was one of the first ones I saw on a fire string just killing it. Like, so I was already blown away. Like, man, he's a great bass player, you know, because at the time I was, you know, I was playing bass too. But he killed it. And then they got to the middle part of the show. He jumps off the bass, jumps on the saxophone, and I just fell off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, man, this, this dude here, crazy. I was like, man, sax play bass and saxophone like that? Oh, man. He's an alien. He well, why do you think he doesn't get the same type of props as, say, Kenny G? It's that this is another another off the film okay. conversation. <laughs> you guys, you, you will probably already know what I'm going to say, but hey, he must yeah. have been Clive Davis's favorite, though. Kenny G, the amount well, of, of albums right. and money that was thrown at him promotion. Yeah. You must. I mean, look, don't let me wrong. I love love Kenny G, but I, I, was, but I love Jared, but he just he was. He, we all he, Yeah, I mean, I think in the mid nineties, early nineties, we, we he was. Getting some play on BT, it's but off, then you know, off conversation. This is up. Yeah. Off. Listen, Chucky, you got to talk. I mean, if you talked about games already, apologize. But was, okay. was that song coming from a personal experience when you was no, 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 it was just from a, yeah, just from a, a you know, just making it up on the spot. That song, games, came up. Uh, I went to Cleveland, Ohio, to to work with my good friend, rest in peace, Gerald Levert. Uh, me and Gerald were in the studio and we were just coming up with ideas for uh, for my Nice and Wild record. And I had already recorded the entire record for Nice and Wild. And we were in the studio. I came up with the drums and the and the chords, the da, ga, ga, and I started playing it. And Gerald just kept saying, why you wanna? You know, he just kept doing that, why you Wow. Why you wanna? And I said, play your games on me. And he said, that's it. Let's write it. So, and he ended up writing. He actually wrote the, the verses to that. So he came up with the whole concept. And, and Joe was just, that's another unsung. Yeah. Artist. Just great writer. I think we don't get to really appreciate Gerald as, as, a, as, a, as a writer and, and producer. Oh. Um, I mean, I great performer. performer, yeah, because we see him more as a performer. That he it overlooked his his actual writing, because there's three people that I always say that you never want to follow in a concert or in a club or anywhere, and those three people are number one, Gerald Levert, number two, Ollie Woodson from The Temptations. Really. And number three, Charlie Wilson. You never want to follow those three dudes ever. Wow. Because I've seen them just go on the stage and just rip it up. I mean, rip it up. I've man. seen Char no, I have seen Charlie Wilson. He's incredible. Oh, I haven't man. seen the other two live. I've seen Charlie, Charlie live. Charlie will wear you out. <laughs> he will wear you out. <laughs> During the time we were writing the game song, me and Gerald, of course, Gerald used to love to go out and club in and just, you know, <laughs> and I was, and I, I'm, I'm really not that kind of guy. I'm not a club type person. I don't go to clubs. I don't, but when you with Gerald, you're kind of forced to go. I'm like, man, I really don't want to go. <laughs> um, he's like, man, come on, Chucky, man, you know, this is your, this is your, your second hometown, man. You need to be here. My, my dad was from Cleveland, Ohio. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so, of course, I had a lot of family there. So, of course, we would go to clubs. They would have live bands there. And, of course, you know, someone would say, oh, Gerald LaBerts, Chucky's in the house. <laughs> Gerald goes up there, rips it up. And then Gerald has the nerve to say, Chucky, come on up here and sing. I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> you must be out of your GD mind. I am not coming. There's a piano up there. I'll go up there and play. But I ain't trying to sing. <laughs> and he had all these girls. All up on the, on the floor after he had sung, these girls, they are all moist and all just ready to fall out, just ready, just dying. You know, <laughs> and what am I going to do to go up there? You crazy. <laughs> Turn away, boy. They'd be like, man, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you work with Jared, was Mark Gordon part of that? Or was this 
Bark is dope. I did. A, I wrote a lot of stuff with Bark too. Bark is really talented, man. A really talented producer as well. And he never got the credit he yeah. deserved. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Man, yeah. That, that just cooler record. That was the jam. That just cooler. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that tr- hard. <laughs> Bark, man. Bark is dope. Yeah, yeah, I've had him on the show, but um, yeah, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll get him back. Colin asked any of the songs that you put on your album was they were they meant for other singers, and you just put kept it for yourself? No, no, it, everything I did is just just for me. I, I didn't really write anything, and then uh, oh no, I I take that back. Oh, okay. I, I, there is one I forgot. There was one song that I wrote that I originally wrote for Charlie Wilson for his project, but I I couldn't get in touch with him. And that song, it was a song called You Don't Know. That was on my second album. I I specifically wrote that in mind for Charlie. Okay. Especially wow. at the end when it does the whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. I, I, all that was, was Charlie. So I tried to, yeah, but I wrote that for him, but never got to him. So I just said, I was, I was did, did he ever find out? No, I don't think he never, no, he never found out. <laughs> ask him about this. So uh, let me see. Uh, Steph, Stephanie said, ask him one of his favorite singers, EJ from the Enchantment. Oh, <laughs> he almost fell up. <laughs> and EJ, bruh. He's one of my favorite, like, male vocalists. I I really tune into people, not so much of their their runs per se, because runs, you know, uh, yeah, that that's a skill. But for me, it's the feeling. It's it's like when you sing, does this person really means what he's singing about? And EJ was all he's all feel. Trust me when I tell you that. And when I would hear his voice, man, it just it broke me down because you can really hear the emotion in his voice. And EJ is just amazing. He was like, he's another unsung vocalist that really didn't get his just due. To to me, I'm just saying, speaking from my experience. But EJ, man, oh man, I love that dude. Wow. Ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People are talking about uh, Gloria and um, oh yeah, you and me. If you would, it's you that I need. That's like my top top ten records. Is you? Is you that I need? Is in my top ten records. You know, top ten ballads of all time. Is that song is in there because of the way EJ sung that song, man. That, that yeah. he's incredible. Yeah. Um, Jeremy is saying, ask Chuck, does he prefer producing using hardware software like Pro Tools, Logic, and stuff? Uh, it depends. It, it depends on the artist that I'm working with, or it just ah. depends on it depends on just the vibe of the record. Because I can do both. I can go completely acoustic or go completely hardware, or I can go software. I just like to keep my options open to whatever. But that's what makes it kind of cool is that some people are just specifically hardware only, and then some people are specifically just software only. I like to keep my I like to keep it 50-50. So guys, if you didn't hear earlier on, um, Chucky is has produced a track uh, for Fred Harmon uh, on a new project he's coming out with, and it's Games 2.0. So it, it, you hear the vibe; it sounds like Games with Fred oh, yeah. and, and and his crew on that. Was that done? Um, Using hardware or software or that particular song was all hard. I mean software. Okay. All software. Yeah. Except for the guitar. The guitar was actually be playing playing my my, my uh my three- I just wonder with like music music genres in from the past that come back around and get recycled. I do feel though with like you know the new Jack era. It, st- it still stays ignored for me. Do you think it'll ever, will it ever come back around? Yeah, it, it will most likely, it will come back around, although it will have a different twist to it 
because I don't think they will, people will really try to replicate that actual sound per se. It will have to, it will have to mesh or gel into what the sound is now. And then it's going to kind of move into that genre, but I don't think it's going to be duplicated 100% like that particular sound. And if somebody does that, then they, they'll probably have the, uh, it'll be a more of a nostalgic type of artist or song. Kind of like what, what's my girl? No, no, Be have, and I say, no, no, no. Oh, Amy Winehouse? It is like an Amy, yeah, because that's really a throwback record for real. So if somebody does something like that, it would have to be from that nostalgic approach. Mm -hmm. But I don't think anybody's going to really uh, take it and do it 100%. It'll have a new jacket. What I don't understand is when we used to buy albums, there was tracks on there you could dance to. Then you'd get, your obviously, your ballads and you get a mid-tempos. It, it, the, the younger generation of R&B artists that, that are doing their thing now, they don't want to seem to dance. They're all, well, they're all I'm, very, it's all very dark, very toxic, very... Everything's... Like, all that energy. You're young, you've I'm, got all that energy. And what, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling depressed listening to this stuff. What, it, what's going on? It's all by design. It's all by design. It's all by design. And again, this is a conversation we have to have <laughs> off camera. <laughs> it's a lot bigger than what you guys think. It's a lot bigger than what you think. Way bigger. There's a whole other narrative that if we have a conversation, your mind will be blown because these are things that Godfather Talk Isn't there an art, a young artist out there that wants to be the next Michael Jackson? I'm not saying be like Michael, but be their own, just a, a superstar that can do it all. We just don't. Well, you they they're out there. Anything like that coming coming up? No. Well, let's put. It, let, let me just tell you like this: there are there are already artists that do have that that drive, that determination, but it's the record companies they have a certain narrative and agenda that they want to portray and they want to release and they're not going to allow that because Don't they, they want to make millions of dollars though I, you know you're talking yeah. about a superstar that could generate millions of dollars for the music industry <laughs> don't they want that anymore that's changed it doesn't yeah. matter that. wow yeah it doesn't doesn't yeah. matter Chucky, when's your third day okay so astrid is uh, said when's your third album coming out uh, probably not until I, I actually, I had a record that was ready to go, but the last minute I changed the entire format of my record. What? And yeah. I changed the entire format. Yeah. And now I'm recutting a whole nother record, but I'm going to keep this one though. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it, but I totally, I just got another vibe. I got a whole okay. nother and I said, you know what, this is what I need to focus on and not you know, not focus on the, the old stuff, you know, because I did a record with just all these different genres of old school, 60s, 70s, 80s. Okay. Instead of doing that, I would rather just do something completely different and new. So that's what I'm focused on now to do. that. I'd rather do that than the last project that I did. So I probably won't have anything, probably not until the end of the year. Are you going to say then that this last project you did, would, would what, who would it appeal to musically? Would it appeal to us? You've grown up with it. Well, it yeah, it more or less catered to like you know the older 35, 40, and so older. We're not going to hear that then. You've, you've no. shelved that. Not, not right now, you won't. <laughs> right Can you still hit the high notes, Colin X? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, I won't uh, try to hit it right now, but I can definitely. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jimmy Wait. Jack. <laughs> yeah, I can still hit it. <laughs> Jimmy says, "What was your favorite song to play when you were touring with Lionel Rich? This was last tour with Lionel. What was your Our favorite? favorite song? Heads down to play when we're on tour is Zoom. That's my song. Is wow. I light up every time we. Well, when he feels like he wants to do it, then when we when we actually do the song, that's my favorite song to play. Yeah, I do wonder the because uh, I know Big Bob did did his version of it." Um, yeah. yeah, 
But um, does Lando, somebody asked, does Lando get on the keys when he's uh, doing a tour? Does he yeah. do the commoners so easy like? Does he play the... Yes, he gets on the piano and he plays. Have you seen the, the Netflix documentary, The Greatest Night in Pop? I have. Because I seen a I seen a side to Lionel that I didn't even know in that. I was just oh, blown yeah. away. I didn't know yeah. he could all them stars in one room and he just he could just yeah. handle it. I, I was just completely mesmerized by that. Yeah. That dude, I, I I always tell Lionel that at the end of the day, or if you decide to move on with your career, I said, dude, you could be a diplomat. Or you could be a you could be a, a governor, a president. Wow. He's that, he is that, that captivating to me. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. and I've met a lot of people in my, in my life, in my career, in front of the scenes and behind the scenes. I've worked with everybody. I've, I've met all the stars that you can imagine from when I used to live with my godfather, all the people that used to come by the studio. I mean, come by his house, you know, as a kid. That's, that's why I'm never starstruck. I've never ever, because I've met all these people, you know, in their natural environment. So it's never an issue for me. I've only, like I said, I've all, well, I've only fanned out twice, you know, in my entire <laughs> 42 years of being in this business. So, Is that Vanity and uh, David Foster? That, well, Vanity, well, no, that was just outright love. I just, <laughs> I fanned out when I first met Stevie and, when I met David Foster. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not, not in a crazy, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just, my hands were cold. You know, I was like shaking hands. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I know I know the answer to this, but, you know, uh, Jeremy's asking about who your favorite producers are. And I know you'd probably have David Foster up there. Who else would make that, that those lists? Uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. I mean, yeah, we, we've I'm, done a countdown. They, they, they're, they're awesome. Yeah, I mean, there's quite a few, but uh, but Barry White, of course. Yeah, yeah, his godfather. My godfather, Maurice White. Oh, Maurice. Oh, yeah. F and Fire, yeah. yeah. Uh, Maurice. Uh, God. Prince. Yeah. Oh, boy. There's, there's just so many, man. You know, it's, it's hard to... You know, it's so hard to, to really uh, pinpoint them out. But, yeah, there, there's a lot. But those, I would have to say, are my notables that s stood out that really defined me as a musician and as a, as a, as a producer. One thing, I'm, I, I've seen some old clips of, of Barry White talking about the ch need to change and adapt around the music industry. And I'm thinking... He was saying this in the seventies about all oh, this, uh, you know, this big studios. We're not going to use that, and we're going to use computers. You're going to. Have to I'm thinking, man, this guy. Like I said, yeah. Like I said earlier, I've been around my godfather since I was nine years old, and there's things that he's told me back then that he told me was going to happen, and everything he's told me has come to pass. Wow. That's why. When I think about it, I have a, a a notebook full of just notes of everything there, and I wish I would have written down everything he's he said. I I remember it, but a lot of the things that he told me, he was just way ahead of, of way ahead of his time, mm -hmm. um, and he's always been like that. He he has always been like that. He would always pinpoint things. He told me way back in nineteen ninety. I'll never forget this. He said, uh, Chuck Luck. He's called me Chuck Luck. You know, he said, Chuck Luck, just so you know, there's gonna be a black president. You know? <laughs> so that, and you know, it's like, man, this, you know, but like, come on, BW, you tripping, man. Come on, man. You no, know, you know, but he he called it. He said, There's gonna be a black president, probably in a you know, probably in another 20 years or so. He said, but it ain't what you're gonna think. It's not gonna be what you think it is. He said it's gonna be, you know, he would say stuff like, you know, it's gonna be the black face of the new world order, you know, things like <laughs> crazy, you know. And but back then, people would say, "Man, this dude is crazy," you know. But yeah, but especially <laughs> that's just one little thing. Yeah, but especially what a lot of what he talks about about the change in the music, music. industry, about the how the industry is changing, how you need oh, to understand yeah. the business. He was way ahead of his time. 
he was the one who told me to get off the base because I wanted to be a bass player. Oh. He would say, Chuck Luck, get off that base. Get on the keys. That's what you need to do. He said, the keys. This was before computers, before all the drum machines, before all of that. He said, start focus, focusing on those keyboards. He said, because the keyboards are going to replicate everything. He said, everything, Chuck Luck. And when I say everything, I mean everything. And this was like maybe six or seven years before. That's incredible. Started How you them- knew that? How oh, that's incredible. You need to watch some of his clips, the interviews, and you see him saying these things from the 70s. And you're like, wait a minute, I, this, yeah. this is stuff, you know, no one's talking about. Oh, he already, yeah, he already knew. He he had that, see, he had that Virgo rising and that, 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 that um, I forgot the word, but it's just like an intuition, like a forward mm process to where he already seen it in his head so uh and he had no filter either if you if you really know him and you sit down with him you know he will tell you just like he'll tell you exactly what it is and all of his different philosophies and things that he spoke about i adapted at a very early age i really did and it really helped me to define the way i need to move in this business because if I didn't, I just would have been your average person, probably been long forgotten, you know. But the way, the things that he taught me, it made me move a certain way. And I'm thankful for that. He still lives in me, you know, his spirit. still He still lives in me. But, man, I miss that dude so much, man. You have no idea. Were you ever going to do any, any, any musical tribute to him? Just, you know, oh, yeah. I, I, I am. And in fact, that was one of the things I wasn't going to tell you, but I am going to do, do a little tribute in this show. I'm going to do okay. a, just a little snippet for him, you know? Yeah. I, mean, I, I think that there, there's so much that we, unfortunately, during the times when he was, you know, we didn't have the outlets where, like the podcast, where we can get to ask these questions and yeah. we didn't get to, to really understand and celebrate him because, you know, for me, he always looked like he was an older guy because he was big and of course, yeah. And yeah, so I used to think like, oh yeah, he's he's kind of yeah. Lou Rawls kind of generation. Right, exactly, exactly. No, he was so much more, man. You know, he's so much more. And to sit with him in the studio as a kid, you know, I just took all that in, man, and just said, Okay, I, I got it. You know, I totally got where where he where he was coming from. Yeah. And it was so much larger and bigger in life. And if his complexion would have been maybe five shades lighter, mm. he would probably even as big as some of the other artists around, you know, at that time. Barry was big in the eighties, especially Barry, Barry White was huge. Yeah, he was huge. He was huge. 70, yeah, seventies, eighties, he was huge. Yeah. I got I got a front row seat of that. I got I I had first hand experience in that. I mean, he came to my attention more when he did the when he did Secret Gardens because that was like my yeah, yeah. generation of music and stuff like that. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, what, what it, cool. But again, to actually see him in the studio with a sixty-piece orchestra, sixty-piece yeah. orchestra. I mean, that doesn't seem unheard yeah. of. You know, <laughs> you guys play this part. Da 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 da. You you guys do this horns. You do this woodwinds, strings, violas, cellos. He broke all that stuff down, man. He was incredible. There's no way Parker Jr. talk about being part of working with him and and how yeah. he just had to, you know, how he, he got his voice, how he was able to, you know, get get some production. Yeah. And Ray is dope. Ray is woo woo <laughs> Ray woo Ray. Yeah, Ray's dope, man. Okay. We, 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 I'm gonna get Agent Chucky to help me help me connect to Ray and and uh, <laughs> Ray Super Dope. I know your hand is hurt, but just a few questions that people are asking here: Did you ever get to work with Whitney? Me to work with Whitney? Wow, uh, never had a chance to work with her, but I do have a crazy story that I'm only tell here that I've told nowhere else. Nowhere else. I had a run in. I had a run in with Whitney. Um, this was during 1995. 
At the time, she was married to Bobby. I was on tour with New Edition. Okay. Uh, home Again uh, uh, tour. Uh, I, I was the musical director for the Home Again tour. And, um, and we were doing, we took a break in the middle of the tour. They ended up doing Saturday Night Live. And they did two songs. They did Hit Me Off and they did Still In Love with the two songs. So, of course, you know, we, we had to you know, cut the show. We had to cut the song down a little bit, make it show format. Uh, so Wendy ends up, you know, she's traveling with us on the, on the, on the tours uh, for this little run. So we're, we're at Saturday Night Live, you know, and I actually met Nippy like way before that when she first started. She was opening up for Jeffrey Osborne and my friend Rex Salas was playing, uh, he was playing with Jeffrey Osborne. He's the first one that told me, man, you got to check out the singer with Whitney Houston. So I met her there, but then next, you know, years later, we're at Saturday Night Live. We do the sound check for Hit Me Off. Now, mind you, I, I'm only musically responsible for the music. So they do the test run. You know, we're, we're at sound check rehearsal. We do the rehearsal. So after everybody finishes the song, you know, Nippy is sitting in the audience. All of a sudden, I hear a Chucky. <laughs> come here, come here, baby, come here, come here. I'm like, okay. So I walk down. I walk, you know, off the stage. The guys are still on stage. She pulls me to the side and she says, look, why aren't you focusing more on Bobby? Bobby is the star here. He is the star of this. How come you were not? Why is he only getting so much little time? I'm like, no. I have nothing to do with the camera shots. And when I, she, I said, I'm only responsible for the music. And when I say she blessed me, when I say blessed, I mean, she cursed me. She blessed me out. Like, you need to fix that. You need to, but Bobby is the one that needs to be, he's a star of this show. He needs to be the one that needs to get more so and so. I'm like, Nip, this is the, if you hear Hit Me Off, the, all the guys are singing. I can't replace like, you know, Johnny's part with Bobby. It's like, this, this is the, the song. She tore, when I say she tore me up, wow. she tore me up. And all I could do was say, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But as a musical director, and as a as a as a diplomat, sometimes you just got to take that. And I took it well because JG afterwards, Johnny Johnny Gill put me aside and said, "Man, he said, man, she tore your ass up." He said, and you were just sitting there just smiling, man. I was like, "What was I supposed to do? What was I supposed to do?" I was like, "I mean, she tore me up, man." But you know, again. I, I just took that and said, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And you know what? Two days later, after it was all over, it was a success. Two days later, we were, uh, I think we were in Nebraska or something. I can't remember where. We stopped to get something to eat, and she she said, Chucky, come here. And I'm like, oh, Lord. I said, hey, <laughs> said, let me talk to you, baby. Let me talk to you for a second. I said, okay. She came over, and she said, I'm sorry, I was out of line and I apologize. You know, uh, I said, Nip, it's, it's cool, it's all good. She, but she realized that it really wasn't my, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't my fault, but she apologized. And man, I always love her for that, man. You know, cause yeah. she didn't have to. I just took it as, you know, it's just a time where, you know, cause she was riding hard for Bobby and she should, that was her husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want that, you know. But you know, I just took it as okay. You know, she's riding for for Bob, and that and that's cool. You know, but yeah. she apologized, and I, I thought, hey, you know, it's all good. And it, you know, we just kept it kept it pushing. Yeah, but you know, somebody else would have gone to management or gone to Bobby and said, "Look, Bobby, I said I'm, I'm but, but you just thought." Well, I you know again you know because I'm the MD, you know, I was the musical director, so you know. This is mid nineties, Whitney. I think we you must have knew by then. What, I had an idea what Whitney would have may have been may have been like. So you just took it on the chin, basically. So yeah, you know. The theme? I mean, yeah. As as a musical director, like I said, it's not always about the music. You know, it's yeah. just all about how to manage egos yeah. and how to manage people, man. And yeah. like I said, I had a front row seat to that from my mother, 
who was a choir director, you know, in mm. church, dealing with a lot of people and, you know, singers and and then with Barry, you know. So yeah. I got front row seat to that. And I saw how they handled a lot of those situations. You Did know? you come over to the UK with Janet when you was when you was directing? No, it? I was gone by then. I left after that time. Yeah. Uh, what was it like producing uh, the track with Phil Bailey? Oh wow! Oh, wow! <laughs> yeah. I was going back. Uh, okay, yeah, I did a song called "Live It Up" and "Stay Right Here," and something's missing. It was those three songs, if I recall. Yeah, I think those are the three songs I did. That was great, man. Working with Philip is just man. We had so much fun in the studio those couple of days. Me and Philip, man. Philip is my dude, anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then also big socks for Bette Midler. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, that, yeah. that was cool because, uh, again, uh, that song, Big Socks, um, I really, I wasn't in the studio when she did her her vocal. She just said, you know, give me a, you know, just put down the, uh, you know, the, 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 the temp and then I'll follow it but she would never let anybody work in the studio with her. So, and the same thing when I worked with Diana Ross, it was the same thing. I didn't, I gave her the, the sound, you know, the, the track, but for some reason, those artists that are like that big, they just will not work with a, you know, a new a producer at that time who they didn't know, wow. you know, they you know, work with them in the studio because they feel like, oh, like I'm gonna go back and say, oh yeah, I worked in the studio with so-and-so. She was terrible, you know, and whatever, blah, blah. But I'm from the old school, you know. I don't tell my, you know, I don't tell my stuff like that. I don't talk about people and how they work in the studio or whatever. Especially if it's something that wasn't uh, really good, or if it was a something that really didn't work out or something. I would never tell that side of the story, you know. So, you know, I was an old soul. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but, but you, yeah, you probably looked like you were twelve, so she probably yeah, thought probably. Of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, it, it's you know as I said, everyone's just um, 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 saying that John John is saying sixty piece orchestra. I, I think it's hard for us to imagine. Um, you know, John just said that uh, Barry was his was also one of his vocal teachers, um, as yeah as, as well. But um, yeah, so we sh may and should expect your third album by the end of the year. That's yeah. Absolutely. Um, Colin is saying that um, it would be great if you were to come to the UK and perform, because I, I know that you were there last year I'm with coming. Lionel on tour, but you're not doing the... I'm coming. I promise you. I, I'm going to say it right now. Me and D had already talked about it. Me and DOA. We're coming to the UK. We're coming to Europe. After we do this, these, you know, these songs, this, this run for the next few shows, whatever, we're definitely coming to, the, to Europe. Yeah, and I guess well, that's the hope that Lana doesn't go on another global talk. <laughs> if right. You take a break. <laughs> right. I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, it's Stevie. It's been chucky with you. I mean, I have to thank you for holding up your phone for this long. I know people have been streaming questions. Stevie, any final questions for? No, I just want to say thanks so much for for you know talking about all the all that stuff you did back then. You know. You will. Man, it's, it's my pleasure. Nobody, you already know, man. That's my guy over there. <laughs> you know, I, for, I, I can speak for all the viewers. It's, it's a real pinch me moment just to, to you know, for, we've been collecting, some of us have been collecting for 30 years to just have this moment to be thought like this. Seriously, mate. That's crazy. You know, we really appreciate it. Yeah, man. And I respect, man. It's nothing but respect from my end, man. I really appreciate you guys, man, for you know, upholding and uplifting the, you know, the soul and R&B, you know, of music, man. That that says a lot about who you guys are. And I, I want to tell you guys to continue success and to keep doing it because if we don't uplift ourselves and keep ourselves up, then nobody will, you know. So I appreciate you guys. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying, Chucky. Shout Dealer Vance for us. Dealer Vance. I'm going I'm to hit, hit him up. I'm going to hit him up. Thank you. Thanks. I'll, with with Nabi because he is somebody you should really talk to. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He has a lot of information. Trust me when I tell you this. 
I, I, I feel him. We just need to get him on here. We need his story back. I'll keep on. I will, and he yeah. will. He will talk too. Trust me, he will talk. Yeah, I, I think. I think what you you found is the um, which you know, people here love the music and celebrate the the, the memories of what yeah. you 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 brought. For me, I'm, I you know it, it it was a travesty that we didn't get three, four, five albums. But our, of course, we understand the story. We understand yeah. the, the, why you, why you did that. But we also understand that man, you know, we we we, we there was a switch from the sort of love wholesome music that we were getting in the 80s and the 70s and 80s and then the 90s became they took all the church folks and says yeah let's <laughs> trip it out of you and exactly what they did yeah so yes. but anyway chucky it's been great so guys look, wait i think when fred come actually maybe fred I, uh, it'd be great to get Fred on when his when his music when it's about to drop because that's yeah. that's as I said as soon as I heard I said that sounds like games, so I'm glad at least you you confirmed that. So he's as I said Chuck has produced a new track for Fred Hammond should be out shortly. So we wait to put, uh, to put on, on that. Um, if you're in the states, you should check out his on song. Unfortunately, we can't see it here in the UK. Um, yeah. April 10th, Yoshi's in yep. is it in Oakland? Yes, in Oakland. So go to yoshis.com and if you're in the Bay Area, um, yeah, check out um, um, with DOA. I would have to say that as much as I love Chucky, DOA probably was one of the most inspirational guests I had oh, when he talks about D his. <laughs> Trust me, D, D is another, he's another that needs to be a diplomat. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, if you please, if you, yeah, as I said, I want to you can remind you guys, I, I had about two or three hours with DOA Allen, talked about his journey and yeah. how he left the Bay Area, went to Los Angeles, trying to make yeah. it, and, you know, how he proved the point to get on the Rhythm Nations tour. A lot of um, kid back there, how he, yeah. he was starstruck when he saw Whitney walking with Bobby, so. <laughs> A lot of kickback. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a big. I, yeah, I love DOA. I loved his energy. Loved his, yeah. his story. So, but he's right. going to be. He's 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 taking the bass and not Chucky anymore. Chucky's. What do you play anymore? What do you play now? Because I don't. You don't do the bass. You don't. You don't. You just took the bass. Yeah, I won't play. I won't play after D, man. Never. I'll never play after D. <laughs> but but when you um, with the university, are you just doing leads or uh, vocals? Or do you play any instruments? Uh, well, you know, at a couple of the shows where, when we had the time, I did sit down and play piano. Like on the show we did in L.A., I sat and played piano. But for this particular show, it's just going to be a straight, just nonstop. There ain't going to be no playing ballads. And, you know, nah. We, we coming with the funk on this one. Yeah. But yeah. With, later on, though, I will jump on the bass and, and, and you know, I will jump eventually. I'll play bass and guitar and keys. But just right now, we just don't have the time to really put that type of show together. Yeah. Because everybody's really busy, man. So. Yeah. I mean, I would love, you know, I love what Babyface is doing because he sings prerogative and don't be cool. Yeah. And, and all he sings all the hits he's written for others and some of his hits. And, you know, if you sang, you'll spread my wings and stuff. Oh, yeah. Like, Doing all that stuff. I mean, would we ever? I mean, would we ever get a Chucky Booker album like he's you're playing your both out your catalog and and your stuff? And I will. Now, do let him go and get his food. Now, I think he yeah. wants to get his dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Chuck, yeah. Well, anyway, I'll uh, yeah, I'll I'll deal with Vance. I'll I'll, I'll hit, hit you up about him and and yeah, and, uh, yeah there are three people that's going to be Fred Hammond. Dale Vance and and Ray Parker Jr. But we'll we'll talk off a, a line of that. But appreciate it, guys. Say thanks to Chucky. Uh, John John's going to be at the show, so um, and we're going to get John John back as well. All right, Chucky, we'll let you go. You <laughs> take care, man. Good night. Take care. Good night. All right. Wow. Okay. What did you think? Like I say, it's a real, and I'm speaking for all the viewers here. It's a real. It's a real pinch me moment you know I, 30 years on you know from buying the guy's albums and buying all these productions to actually just 
I would have never have thought I'd have been talking to him 30 <laughs> years on, on a, live, a live YouTube podcast, you know, it's just, is is a real, you know, you've got John John from Troop in there, one of, you know, one of my favourite R&B New Jack groups. I mean, oh, yeah, you, you did have them in your top three. Yeah, I mean, I love John you know, John. Always, he's always showing me love and, and It's incredible. And, you know, and I'm sure the listeners, who, who and there's a lot of collectors in, in that, in there tonight, are, are all feeling the same way as well. Just to wear all all that stuff that doesn't really you you know there's probably people who've got these albums that they just don't know who you know anything about them because it was just so obscure you know Copper who is who is I just remember buying this this girl's album called Copper thinking it's like Janet Jackson but no one's heard it you know it's like funky New Jack West Coast so just to hear, hear what he said about it you know it's great yeah, yeah. Vance. i keep banging on about this guy to your dealer vance we've got to get him on you know i have reached out to him i've messaged him he does okay. want to come on but i need to probably need to go back again but we need to get that's right yeah I'll, I'll send chucky chucky said he'll he'll, he'll, he'll speak up to him uh yeah carlo was right i think when you start to drop out some of the uh you you, you went into the caravan to dig out some of the, the uh <laughs> so they can always do that i can always do that <laughs> yeah no, but I think one of the things, as I said, you know, um, the uh, things about the industry that, that, that Chucky, you know, you, if you, you know, the more you say, well, he knows the level that I just, you know, he's obviously understands the level to it all that we're we're not part A to. So maybe maybe you'll tell us one day. Yeah. Okay. John John said that he'll be able to get Dylan Man. Yeah, John John. Okay. Um, but we're going to have to even get. Um, um, we're going to have to get John John live as well but yeah john john's gonna get him um... i mean maybe we can get john john and dealer van if he's worked on his new album maybe we can get him on if we you know we've plug in we can plug john john's album get d on they can talk about it we'll have a good have a good chat yeah 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 now i'll be able to uh, get yeah, john john's here so he's listened in and stuff like that um uh, yeah you know I, i'm yeah anyone Go and watch uh, Coming to America. You see John John on there as well. <laughs> um, but what's, yeah. our, what's our next? Um, what's our next live coming up? Um, no, on on the seventh, we've got. Um, oh yes, I forgot that we've got. Um, so we're doing a, we're doing the guy album. Um, we're going to rank the songs from ten to one, and our special guest is Corel Henderson. So. For those who might not know Cora Henderson, if you think um, Kids at Work, he was the lead singer for Kids at Work. So that's your be best. And he was he was in and around when they were making the Guy album. He probably, you know, Aaron, in a way, Aaron took his spot because he, Timmy Gatlin and Teddy were Kids at Work and he decided to go a different direction. Aaron went in a different direction. So it's going to be interesting having Corel on the show because he, you know, if you ever saw the interview, he was talking about how Gene got busted. So people heard about Gene was with kids at work and then he was disappeared and he came back when Guy came out. He explained what happened, how Gene was trying to make the money to promote kids at work, got busted and went to jail and, and he decided to go a different direction. So that's going to be interesting. It's going to be really good. Um, Corel Henderson as our guest at uh, New Jackson Podcast next week, Sunday. Um, but we're, we're also going to have um, um, R&B hip New Jack producer Herb Middleton um, coming as well. So he um, he's done um, a lot of a lot of stuff. So we're going to hear his story, and of course John John. We're going to get John John back live and um, deal with as, uh, as as um, as as we're working on as well. But um, yes, thank you guys for uh, tuning in. Um, Stevie, on Sunday, our clocks go forward, so we'll be at the same Yeah, thanks for reminding me. What happens is the fact that the times have been out of sync with the Americans because their their clocks went forward three weeks ago. So all the interviews have just been off off based on the fact that. Uh, Listen, we need that clock. To, we need that clock. To, we need the sun. We need we need to bring badly because the UK is just. What miserable weather we've been! Grey, dull, wet. Yeah. 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 Bring on the spring, please. Bring, Bring on the spring. On. But anyway, guys, thanks for for tuning in. Thanks for um, thanks again to Chucky. Um, yeah, he 
I got I got sorry for Chuck because he was holding the phone with his hand and had to quickly charge charge it. But um, but you know he was the trooper just being on and stuff like that. So um, yeah. But we'll see you guys next uh, next week and um, and um, yeah. But we'll always have a, have, a yeah, have a great Easter. Enjoy Good Friday some tomorrow. And, you know if you if you're religious, it's it's obviously a religious time of the year. So. God bless you all. Thanks for tuning in. We, yeah. we appreciate it. Yes. Okay, Colin. Yep. We, we, maybe we'll get you to come sing live on a show one of these days, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just before we go, Steve, are you going to the R&B block party in London? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 But thank you guys for tuning in. And um, yeah. <laughs> Did you see this? Yeah, yeah, you, you got me there. You got me. You got me tonight. What did you think of that? Because he had no idea. I mean, he had no idea of our in joke. But, uh, no, he's, he's right. You know what I mean? He did. He did a cross. You know, I'm, I, it's an in joke. It's an in joke on the podcast. Just get your sleeping bag out, guys, for the day. Because he did a lot of stuff that will make you sleep sleep very well. But he also did a lot of other stuff for Chicago, for Cheryl Lynn. You know, one day, in fact, the, if we ever stop doing this podcast, the final podcast top 10 we should do is the top 10 David Foster, mate. To see, okay. see the podcast out. Okay, yeah, we'll, know, we'll keep we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. We won't talk about ending the podcast, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's the final one we should do. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll get well, You got time. me, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. Yeah, yeah. Connor says he's fit. Yeah, anyway, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>